Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. This evening we're reading a work by a man better known for speculative fiction. It's A Short History of the World by H.G. Wells, published by Macmillan and Company, New York, 1922. Let's begin. A Short History of the World, Chapter 1, The World in Space. The story of our world is a story that is still very imperfectly known. A couple of hundred years ago, men possessed the history of little more than the last 3,000 years. What happened before that time was a matter of legend and speculation. Over a large part of the civilized world, it was believed and taught that the world had been created suddenly in 4004 BC, though authorities differed as to whether this had occurred in the spring or autumn of that year. This fantastically precise misconception was based upon a too literal interpretation of the Hebrew Bible and upon rather arbitrary theological assumptions connected therewith. Such ideas have long since been abandoned by religious teachers, and it is universally recognized that the universe in which we live has, to all appearances, existed for an enormous period of time, and possibly for endless time. Of course, there may be deception in these appearances, as a room may be made to seem endless by putting mirrors facing each other at either end, but that the universe in which we live has existed only for six or seven thousand years may be regarded as an altogether exploded idea. The Earth, as everybody knows nowadays, is a spheroid, a sphere slightly compressed, orange fashion, with a diameter of nearly 8,000 miles. Its spherical shape has been known at least to a limited number of intelligent people for nearly 2,500 years, but before that time it was supposed to be flat, and various ideas which now seem fantastic were entertained about its relations to the sky and the stars and planets. We now know that it rotates upon its axis, which is about 24 miles shorter than its equatorial diameter, every 24 hours, and that this is the cause of the alternations of day and night, that it circles about the sun in a slightly distorted and slowly variable oval path in a year. Its distance from the sun varies between 91 and a half millions at its nearest and 94 and a half million miles. About the Earth circles a smaller sphere, the Moon, at an average distance of 239,000 miles. Earth and Moon are not the only bodies to travel round the Sun. There are also the planets, Mercury and Venus, at distances of 36 and 67 millions of miles, and beyond the circle of the Earth and disregarding a belt of numerous smaller bodies, the planetoids, there are Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune at mean distances of 141, 483, 886, 1,782, and 1,793 millions of miles, respectively. These figures in millions of miles are very difficult for the mind to grasp. It may help the reader's imagination if we reduce the sun and planets to a smaller, more conceivable scale. If, then, we represent our Earth as a little ball of one inch diameter, the sun would be a big globe nine feet across, and 323 yards away, that is, about a fifth of a mile, four or five minutes walking. The moon would be a small pea, two feet and a half from the world. 
between Earth and Sun, there would be the two inner planets, Mercury and Venus, at distances of 125 and 250 yards from the Sun. All round and about these bodies, there would be emptiness until you came to Mars, 175 feet beyond the Earth. Jupiter nearly a mile away, a foot in diameter. Saturn a little smaller, two miles off. Uranus four miles off. And Neptune six miles off. Then nothingness and nothingness except for small particles and drifting scraps of attenuated vapor for thousands of miles. The nearest star to Earth on this scale would be 40,000 miles away. These figures will serve perhaps to give one some conception of the immense emptiness of space in which the drama of life goes on. For in all this enormous vacancy of space, we know certainly of life only upon the surface of our Earth. It does not penetrate much more than three miles down into the 4,000 miles that separate us from the center of our globe, and it does not reach more than five miles above its surface. Apparently, all the limitlessness of space is otherwise empty and dead. The deepest ocean dredgings go down to five miles. The highest recorded flight of an aeroplane is little more than four miles. Men have reached to seven miles up in balloons, but at a cost of great suffering. No bird can fly so high as five miles, and small birds and insects, which have been carried up by aeroplanes, drop off insensible far below that level. Chapter 2 The World in Time in the last 50 years, there has been much very fine and interesting speculation on the part of scientific men upon the age and origin of our Earth. Here, we cannot pretend to give even a summary of such speculations, because they involve the most subtle mathematical and physical considerations. The truth is that the physical and astronomical sciences are still too undeveloped as yet to make anything of the sort more than an illustrative guesswork. The general tendency has been to make the estimated age of our globe longer and longer. It now seems probable that the Earth has had an independent existence as a spinning planet flying round and round the sun for a longer period than two billion years. It may have been much longer than that. This is a length of time that absolutely overpowers the imagination. Before that vast period of separate existence, the Sun and Earth and the other planets that circulate round the Sun may have been a great swirl of diffused matter in space. The telescope reveals to us in various parts of the heavens luminous spiral clouds of matter, the spiral nebulae, which appear to be in rotation about a center. It is supposed by many astronomers that the sun and its planets were once such a spiral, and that their matter has undergone concentration into its present form. Through majestic eons that concentration went on, until in that vast remoteness of the past for which we have given figures, the world and its moon were distinguishable. They were spinning then much faster than they are spinning now. They were at a lesser distance from the sun. They traveled round it very much faster, and they were probably incandescent or molten at the surface. The sun itself was a much greater blaze in the heavens. If we could go back through that infinitude of time and see the Earth in this earlier stage of its history, we should behold a scene more like the interior of a blast furnace or the surface of a lava flow before it cools and cakes over than any other contemporary scene. No water would be visible, because all the water there was would still be superheated steam in a stormy atmosphere of sulfurous and metallic vapors. Beneath this would swirl and boil an ocean of molten rock substance. 
Across a sky of fiery clouds, the glare of the hurrying sun and moon would sweep swiftly like hot breaths of flame. Slowly, by degrees, as one million of years followed another, this fiery scene would lose its eruptive incandescence. The vapors in the sky would rain down and become less dense overhead. Great, slaggy cakes of solidifying rock would appear upon the surface of the molten sea and sink under it to be replaced by other floating masses. The sun and moon, growing now each more distant and each smaller, would rush with diminishing swiftness across the heavens. The moon now, because of its smaller size, would be already cooled far below incandescence and would be alternately obstructing and reflecting the sunlight in a series of eclipses and full moons. And so, with a tremendous slowness through the vastness of time, the earth would grow more and more like the earth on which we live. Until at last, an age would come when, in the cooling air, steam would begin to condense into clouds, and the first rain would fall hissing upon the first rocks below. For endless millennia, the greater part of the earth's water would still be vaporized in the atmosphere. But there would now be hot streams running over the crystallizing rocks below, and pools and lakes into which these streams would be carrying detritus and depositing sediment. At last, a condition of things must have been attained in which a man might have stood upon the earth and looked about him and lived. If we could have visited the earth at that time, we should have stood on great lava-like masses of rock without a trace of soil or touch of living vegetation under a storm-rent sky. Hot and violent winds, exceeding the fiercest tornado that ever blows, and downpours of rain such as our milder, slower earth today knows nothing of, might have assailed us. The water of the downpour would have rushed by us, muddy with the spoils of the rocks, coming together into torrents, cutting deep gorges and canyons as they hurried past to deposit their sediment in the earliest seas. Through the clouds we should have glimpsed a great sun moving visibly across the sky and in its wake and in the wake of the moon would have come a diurnal tide of earthquake and upheaval. And the moon, which nowadays keeps one constant face to earth, would then have been rotating visibly and showing the side it now hides so inexorably. The earth aged. One million years followed another, and the day lengthened. The sun grew more distant and milder. The moon's pace in the sky slackened. The intensity of rain and storm diminished, and the water in the first seas increased and ran together into the ocean garment our planet henceforth wore. But there was no life as yet upon the earth. The seas were lifeless, and the rocks were barren. Chapter 3. The Beginnings of Life As everybody knows nowadays, the knowledge we possess of life before the beginnings of human memory and tradition is derived from the markings and fossils of living things in the stratified rocks. We find preserved in shale and slate, limestone and sandstone, bones, shells, fibers, stems, fruits, footmarks, scratchings, and the like, side by side with the ripple marks of the earliest tides and the pittings of the earliest rainfalls. It is by the sedulous examination of this record of the rocks that the past history of the Earth's life has been pieced together. That much nearly everybody knows today. The sedimentary rocks do not lie neatly stratum above stratum. They have been crumpled, bent, thrust about, distorted and mixed together like the leaves of a library 
that has been repeatedly looted and burnt, and it is only as a result of many devoted lifetimes of work that the record has been put into order and read. The whole compass of time represented by the record of the rocks is now estimated at 1,600,000,000 years. The earliest rocks in the record are called by geologists the Azoic rocks, because they show no traces of life. Great areas of these Azoic rocks lie uncovered in North America, and they are of such a thickness that geologists consider that they represent a period of at least half of the 1,600,000,000 years which they assign to the whole geological record. Let me repeat this profoundly significant fact. Half the great interval of time since land and sea were first distinguishable on Earth has left us no traces of life. There are ripplings and rain marks still to be found in these rocks, but no marks nor vestiges of any living thing. Then, as we come up the record, signs of past life appear and increase. The age of the world's history in which we find these past traces is called by geologists the Lower Paleozoic Age. The first indications that life was astir are vestiges of comparatively simple and lowly things. The shells of small shellfish, the stems and flower-like heads of zoophytes, seaweeds and the tracks and remains of sea worms and crustacea. Very early appear certain creatures rather like plant lice, crawling creatures which could roll themselves up into balls as the plant lice do the trilobites. Later, by a few million years or so, come certain sea scorpions, more mobile and powerful creatures than the world had ever seen before. None of these creatures were of very great size. Among the largest were certain of the sea scorpions, which measured nine feet in length. There are no signs whatever of land life of any sort, plant or animal. There are no fishes, nor any vertebrated creatures in this part of the record. Essentially, all the plants and creatures which have left us their traces from this period of the Earth's history are shallow water and intertidal beings. If we wished to parallel the flora and fauna of the lower Paleozoic rocks on the Earth today, we should do it best, except in the matter of size by taking a drop of water from a rock pool or scummy ditch and examining it under a microscope. The little crustacea, the small shellfish, the zoophytes and algae we should find there would display a quite striking resemblance to these clumsier, larger prototypes that once were the crown of life upon our planet. It is well, however, to bear in mind that the lower Paleozoic rocks probably do not give us anything at all representative of the first beginnings of life on our planet. Unless a creature has bones or other hard parts, unless it wears a shell or is big enough and heavy enough to make characteristic footprints and trails in mud, it is unlikely to leave any fossilized traces of its existence behind. Today, there are hundreds of thousands of species of small, soft-bodied creatures in our world, which it is inconceivable can ever leave any mark for future geologists to discover. In the world's past, millions of millions of species of such creatures may have lived and multiplied and flourished and passed away without a trace remaining. The waters of the warm and shallow lakes and seas of the so-called Azoic period may have teemed with an infinite variety of lowly, jelly-like, shell-less and boneless creatures, and a multitude of green scummy plants may have spread over the sunlit intertidal rocks and beaches. The record of the rocks is no more a complete record of life in the past then the books of a bank are a record of the existence of everybody in the neighborhood. 
It is only when a species begins to secrete a shell or a spicule or a carapace or a lime-supported stem and so put by something for the future that it goes upon the record. But in rocks of an age prior to those which bear any fossil traces, graphite, a form of uncombined carbon, is sometimes found and some authorities consider that it may have been separated out from combination through the vital activities of unknown living things. Chapter 4 The Age of Fishes In the days when the world was supposed to have endured for only a few thousand years, it was supposed that the different species of plants and animals were fixed and final. They had all been created exactly as they are today, each species by itself. But as men began to discover and study the record of the rocks, this belief gave place to the suspicion that many species had changed and developed slowly through the course of ages. And this again expanded into a belief in what is called organic evolution, a belief that all species of life upon earth, animal and vegetable alike, are descended by slow continuous processes of change from some very simple ancestral form of life, some almost structureless living substance, far back in the so-called Azoic Seas. This question of organic evolution, like the question of the age of the earth, has in the past been the subject of much bitter controversy. There was a time when a belief in organic evolution was, for rather obscure reasons, supposed to be incompatible with sound Christian, Jewish, and Muslim doctrine. That time has passed, and the men of the most orthodox Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and Mohammedan belief are now free to accept this newer and broader view of a common origin of all living things. No life seems to have happened suddenly upon Earth. Life grew and grows, age by age through gulfs of time at which imagination reels. Life has been growing from a mere stirring in the intertidal slime towards freedom, power, and consciousness. Life consists of individuals. These individuals are definite things. They are not like the lumps and masses, nor even the limitless and motionless crystals of non-living matter, and they have two characteristics no dead matter possesses. They can assimilate other matter into themselves and make it part of themselves, and they can reproduce themselves. They eat and they breed. They can give rise to other individuals, for the most part like themselves, but always also a little different from themselves. There is a specific and family resemblance between an individual and its offspring, and there is an individual difference between every parent and every offspring it produces. And this is true in every species and at every stage of life. Now, scientific men are not able to explain to us either why offspring should resemble nor why they should differ from their parents. But seeing that offspring do at once resemble and differ, it is a matter rather of common sense than of scientific knowledge that, if the conditions under which a species live are changed, the species should undergo some correlated changes. Because in any generation of the species, there must be a number of individuals whose individual differences make them better adapted to the new conditions under which the species has to live, and a number whose individuals whose individual differences make it rather harder for them to live. And on the whole, the former sort will live longer, bear more offspring, and reproduce themselves more abundantly than the latter. And so generation by generation, the average of the species will change in the favorable direction. This process, which is called natural selection, 
is not so much a scientific theory as a necessary deduction from the facts of reproduction and individual difference. There may be many forces at work varying, destroying, and preserving species about which science may still be unaware or undecided. But the man who can deny the operation of this process of natural selection upon life since its beginning must be either ignorant of the elementary facts of life or incapable of ordinary thought. Many scientific men have speculated about the first beginning of life, and their speculations are often of great interest, but there is absolutely no definite knowledge and no convincing guess yet of the way in which life began. But nearly all authorities are agreed that it probably began upon mud or sand in warm, sunlit, shallow, brackish water, and that it spread up the beaches to the intertidal lines and out to the open waters. That early world was a world of strong tides and currents. An incessant destruction of individuals must have been going on through their being swept up the beaches and dried, or by their being swept out to sea and sinking down out of reach of air and sun. Early conditions favor the development of every tendency to root and hold on, every tendency to form an outer skin and casing to protect the stranded individual from immediate desiccation. From the very earliest, any tendency to sensitiveness to taste would turn the individual in the direction of food and any sensitiveness to light would assist it to struggle back out of the darkness of the sea deeps and caverns, or to wriggle back out of the excessive glare of the dangerous shallows. Probably the first shells and body armor of living things were protections against drying rather than against active enemies. But tooth and claw come early into our earthly history. We have already noted the size of the earlier water scorpions. For long ages, such creatures were the supreme lords of life. Then, in a division of these Paleozoic rocks called the Silurian Division, which many geologists now suppose to be as old as 500 million years, there appears a new type of being, equipped with eyes and teeth and swimming powers of an altogether more powerful kind. These were the first known backboned animals, the earliest fishes, the first known vertebrata. These fishes increase greatly in the next division of rocks, the rocks known as the Devonian system. They are so prevalent that this period of the record of the rocks has been called the Age of Fishes. Fishes of a pattern now gone from the earth, and fishes allied to the sharks and sturgeons of today rushed through the waters, leapt in the air, browsed among the seaweeds, pursued and preyed upon one another, and gave a new liveliness to the waters of the world. None of these were excessively big by our present standards. Few of them were more than two or three feet long, but there were exceptional forms which were as long as twenty feet. We know nothing from geology of the ancestors of these fishes. They do not appear to be related to any of the forms that preceded them. Zoologists have the most interesting views of their ancestry but these they derive from the study of the development of the eggs of their still-living relations, and from other sources. Apparently, the ancestors of the vertebrata were soft-bodied and perhaps quite small swimming creatures, who began first to develop hard parts as teeth round and about their mouths. The teeth of a skate or dogfish cover the roof and floor of its mouth, and pass at the lip into the flattened, tooth-like scales that encase most of its body. As the fishes develop these teeth scales in the geological record, they swim out of the hidden darkness of the past into the light, the first vertebrated animals visible in the record. Chapter 5 
the age of the coal swamps. The land during this age of fishes was apparently quite lifeless. Crags and uplands of barren rock lay under the sun and rain. There was no real soil, for as yet there were no earthworms which helped to make a soil, and no plants to break up the rock particles into mold. There was no trace of moss or lichen. Life was still only in the sea. Over this world of barren rock played great changes of climate. The causes of these changes of climate were very complex, and they have still to be properly estimated. The changing shape of the Earth's orbit, the gradual shifting of the poles of rotation, changes in the shapes of the continents, probably even fluctuations in the warmth of the sun, now conspired to plunge great areas of the Earth's surface into long periods of cold and ice, and now again for millions of years spread a warm or equable climate over this planet. There seem to have been phases of great internal activity in the world's history, when in the course of a few million years, accumulated upthrusts would break out in lines of volcanic eruption and upheaval, and rearrange the mountain and continental outlines of the globe increasing the depth of the sea and the height of the mountains, and exaggerating the extremes of climate. And these would be followed by vast ages of comparative quiescence, when frost, rain, and river would wear down the mountain heights, and carry great masses of silt to fill and raise the sea bottoms, and spread the seas, ever shallower and wider, over more and more of the land. There have been high and deep ages in the world's history, and low and level ages. The reader must dismiss from his mind any idea that the surface of the earth has been growing steadily cooler since its crust grew solid. After that much cooling had been achieved, the internal temperature ceased to affect surface conditions. There are traces of periods of superabundant ice and snow, of glacial ages, that is, even in the Azoic period. It was only towards the close of the Age of Fishes, in a period of extensive shallow seas and lagoons, that life spread itself out in any effectual way from the waters onto the land. No doubt the earlier types of the forms that now begin to appear in great abundance had already been developing in a rare and obscure manner for many scores of millions of years. But now came their opportunity. Plants no doubt preceded animal forms in this invasion of the land, but the animals probably followed up the plant emigration very closely. The first problem that the plant had to solve was the problem of some sustaining stiff support to hold up its fronds to the sunlight when the buoyant water was withdrawn. The second was the problem of getting water from the swampy ground below to the tissues of the plant, now that it was no longer close at hand. The two problems were solved by the development of woody tissue, which both sustained the plant and acted as water carrier to the leaves. The record of the rocks is suddenly crowded by a vast variety of woody swamp plants, many of them of great size. Big tree mosses, tree ferns, gigantic horsetails and the like. And with these, age by age, there crawled out of the water a great variety of animal forms. There were centipedes and millipedes. There were the first primitive insects. There were creatures related to the ancient king crabs and sea scorpions, which became the earliest spiders and land scorpions. And presently, there were vertebrated animals. Some of the earlier insects were very large. There were dragonflies in this period with wings that spread out to 29 inches. In various ways, these new orders and genera had adapted themselves to breathing air. Hitherto, 
all animals had breathed air dissolved in water, and that indeed is what all animals still have to do. But now, in diverse fashions, the animal kingdom was acquiring the power of supplying its own moisture where it was needed. A man with a perfectly dry lung would suffocate today. His lung surfaces must be moist in order that air may pass through them into his blood. The adaptation to air breathing consists in all cases, either in the development of a cover to the old-fashioned gills to stop evaporation, or in the development of tubes or other new breathing organs lying deep inside the body and moistened by a watery secretion. The old gills with which the ancestral fish of the vertebrated line had breathed were inadaptable to breathing upon land, and in the case of this division of the animal kingdom, it is the swimming bladder of the fish which becomes a new, deep-seated breathing organ, the lung. The kind of animals known as amphibia, the frogs and newts of today, begin their lives in the water and breathe by gills, and subsequently the lung, developing in the same way as the swimming bladder of many fishes do, as a bag-like outgrowth from the throat, takes over the business of breathing. The animal comes out on land, and the gills dwindle and the gill slits disappear, all except an outgrowth of one gill slit, which becomes the passage of the ear and eardrum. The animal can now live only in the air, but it must return at least to the edge of the water to lay its eggs and reproduce its kind. All the air-breathing vertebrata of this age of swamps and plants belong to the class amphibia. They were nearly all of them forms related to the newts of today, and some of them attained a considerable size. They were land animals, it is true, but they were land animals needing to live in and near moist and swampy places. And all the great trees of this period were equally amphibious in their habits. None of them had yet developed fruits and seeds of a kind that could fall on land and develop with the help only of such moisture as dew and rain could bring. They all had to shed their spores and water, it would seem, if they were to germinate. It is one of the most beautiful interests of that beautiful science, comparative anatomy, to trace the complex and wonderful adaptations of living things to the necessities of existence in air. All living things, plants and animals alike, are primarily water things. For example, all the higher vertebrated animals above the fishes, up to and including man, pass through a stage in their development in the egg or before birth, in which they have gill slits which are obliterated before the young emerge. The bare, water-washed eye of the fish is protected in the higher forms from drying up by eyelids and glands, which secrete moisture. The weaker sound vibrations of air necessitate an eardrum. In nearly every organ of the body, similar modifications and adaptations are to be detected, similar patchings up to meet aerial conditions. This Carboniferous Age, this age of the amphibia, was an age of life in the swamps and lagoons, and on the low banks among these waters. Thus far life had now extended. The hills and high lands were still quite barren and lifeless. Life had learnt to breathe air indeed, but it still had its roots in its native water. It still had to return to the water to reproduce its kind. Chapter 6 The Age of Reptiles The abundant life of the Carboniferous period was succeeded by a vast cycle of dry and bitter ages. They are represented in the record of the rocks by thick deposits of sandstones and the like, in which fossils are comparatively few. The temperature of the world fluctuated widely, and there were long periods of glacial cold. 
over great areas the former profusion of swamp vegetation ceased, and overlaid by these newer deposits, it began that process of compression and mineralization that gave the world most of the coal deposits of today. But it is during periods of change that life undergoes its most rapid modifications, and under hardship that it learns its hardest lessons. As conditions revert towards warmth and moisture again, we find a new series of animal and plant forms established. We find in the record the remains of vertebrated animals that laid eggs which, instead of hatching out tadpoles which needed to live for a time in water, carried on their development before hatching to a stage so nearly like the adult form that the young could live in air from the first moment of independent existence. Gills had been cut out altogether, and the gill slits only appeared as an embryonic phase. These new creatures without a tadpole stage were the reptiles. Concurrently, there had been a development of seed-bearing trees, which could spread their seed independently of swamps or lakes. There were now palm-like cycads and many tropical conifers, though as yet there were no flowering plants and no grasses. There was a great number of ferns, and there were also now an increased variety of insects. There were beetles, though bees and butterflies had yet to come, but all the fundamental forms of a new real land fauna and flora had been laid down during these vast ages of severity. This new land life needed only the opportunity of favorable conditions to flourish and prevail. Age by age, and with abundant fluctuations, that mitigation came. The still incalculable movements of the Earth's crust, the changes in its orbit, the increase and diminution of the mutual inclination of orbit and pole, worked together to produce a great spell of widely diffused, warm conditions. The period lasted altogether, it is now supposed, upwards of 200 million years. It is called the Mesozoic Period, to distinguish it from the altogether vaster Paleozoic and Azoic periods, together 1400 millions that preceded it, and from the Cainozoic or New Life Period that intervened between its close and the present time. And it is also called the Age of Reptiles, because of the astonishing predominance and variety of this form of life. It came to an end some 80 million years ago. In the world today, the genera of reptiles are comparatively few, and their distribution is very limited. They are more various, it is true, than are the few surviving members of the order of the amphibia, which once in the Carboniferous period ruled the world. We still have the snakes, the turtles and tortoises, the colonia, the alligators and crocodiles, and the lizards. Without exception, they are creatures requiring warmth all the year round. They cannot stand exposure to cold, and it is probable that all the reptilian beings of the Mesozoic suffered under the same limitation. It was a hothouse fauna, living amidst a hothouse flora. It endured no frosts. But the world had at least attained a real dry land fauna and flora as distinguished from the mud and swamp fauna and flora of the previous heyday of life upon Earth. All the sorts of reptile we know now were much more abundantly represented then. Great turtles and tortoises, big crocodiles, and many lizards and snakes. But in addition, there were a number of series of wonderful creatures that have now vanished altogether from the earth. There was a vast variety of beings called the dinosaurs. Vegetation was now spreading over the lower levels of the world, reeds, brakes of fern, and the like. And browsing upon this abundance came a multitude of herbivorous reptiles, 
which increased in size as the Mesozoic period rose to its climax. Some of these beasts exceeded in size any other land animals that have ever lived. They were as large as whales. The Diplodocus carnegie, for example, measured 84 feet from snout to tail. The Gigantosaurus was even greater. It measured a hundred feet. Living upon these monsters was a swarm of carnivorous dinosaurs of a corresponding size. One of these, the Tyrannosaurus, is figured and described in many books as the last word in reptilian frightfulness. While these great creatures pastured and pursued amidst the fronds and evergreens of the Mesozoic jungles, another now-vanished tribe of reptiles, with a bat-like development of the forelimbs, pursued insects and one another, first leapt and parachuted and presently flew amidst the fronds and branches of the forest trees. These were the pterodactyls. These were the first flying creatures with backbones. They mark a new achievement in the growing powers of vertebrated life. Moreover, some of the reptiles were returning to the sea waters. Three groups of big swimming beings had invaded the sea from which their ancestors had come. The Mosasaurs, the Plesiosaurs, and Ichthyosaurs. Some of these again approached the proportions of our present whales. The ichthyosaurs seem to have been quite seagoing creatures, but the plesiosaurs were a type of animal that has no cognate form today. The body was stout and big with paddles, adapted either for swimming or crawling through marshes, or along the bottom of shallow waters. The comparatively small head was poised on a vast snake of a neck, altogether outdoing the neck of the swan. Either the plesiosaur swam and searched for food under the water and fed as the swan will do, or it lurked underwater and snatched at passing fish or beast. Such was the predominant land life throughout the Mesozoic Age. It was by our human standards an advance upon anything that had preceded it. It had produced land animals greater in size, range, power, and activity, more vital, as people say, than anything the world had seen before. In the seas, there had been no such advance, but a great proliferation of new forms of life an enormous variety of squid-like creatures with chambered shells, for the most part coiled, had appeared in the shallow seas. The Ammonites. They had had predecessors in the Paleozoic seas, but now was their age of glory. Today, they have left no survivors at all. Their nearest relation is the pearly nautilus, an inhabitant of tropical waters and a new and more prolific type of fish, with lighter, finer scales than the plate-like and tooth-like coverings that had hitherto prevailed, became and has since remained predominant in the seas and rivers. And with that, I think we'll end our reading from A Short History of the World by H.G. Wells. For short history, it was surprisingly comprehensive. I think we'll be coming back to this one. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, you'll find a link to it on our Goodreads page. Just go to goodreads.com slash boringbooksforbedtime, where you'll find a library of everything read on this podcast. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at Boring Books Pod. We also have a Facebook page where you can leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Until our next boring book, good night.